Okay. <clears throat> All right. Bismillah walhamdulillah. As-salatu was-salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, hopefully everybody had a really good uh, break. Hopefully everybody had some good time off. Um, inshallah, if you got rest, great. If you didn't, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, the good thing about the good thing about fall break or Thanksgiving break is that you're really in this weird limbo between you know this break and the longer break that's about to happen in three weeks. So even if you kind of missed out on an opportunity to really gain some rest, uh, you inshallah should not be too far away from. Uh, another opportunity. Also, everyone's on cruise control right now. Everyone's on cruise control. It's like when you put your car on like this kind of like self-driving mode, right? And like you know that you're heading towards this uh, this massive, massive end of semester, uh, you know, hiatus, inshallah. Um, and you guys are super close to that. All right. Well, inshallah, get started. Um, and uh, I wanted to start today's session specifically just saying alhamdulillah. Um, we are so fortunate, we are so blessed to have what we have in life, y'all, alhamdulillah. Um, I think everyone, sp uh, especially nowadays, should begin each day just showing immense gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they have. Um, it is not a given that we have the blessings that we have in our lives right now. Uh, and y'all can see that from all of the uh, trials and tribulations of the ummah right now. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have seen, you know, moments in the past month and a half, almost two months at this point, of people losing loved ones, people losing homes, people losing their sanity uh, because someone is taking it away from them. Uh, and so, you know, whoever has these blessings in life should be very active about the blessings that they have. Um, don't just passively be uh, consumers of blessings. Be active, uh, you know, be active worshipers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that actually acknowledge the blessings that Allah He gives us. So just wanted to share that. There's a really amazing, actually, I don't know if anybody remembers this, probably about, and, and now probably five, six weeks ago, we actually covered it in one of our sessions um, where there was a man who used to worship Allah for like 50, 60 years and he like did everything right on paper right he used to pray fast give zakah everything that you could imagine that like a muslim has to check off their list he would do it and so allah he responded to this man's life okay and he said you know i have given you my forgiveness or you have earned my forgiveness and the man he kind of arrogantly you know proclaimed to allah he said what do you mean I, I, I've earned your forgiveness? Forgiveness is usually reserved for people who are mistaken. I've done things the right way my entire life. I've done everything seemingly right my entire life. You know, why would you address me as a person who needs to be forgiven? And so because of that statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually inflicted a really severe pain on the like neck of this person. And because of that pain in his neck, you know, some of the scholars, they mentioned that it was like a nerve. So, so it was said that he couldn't pray properly anymore and he couldn't sleep properly anymore. And so after a period of time, the narration mentions that an angel came to him and Allah commanded the angel to relieve this man of the pain that he was going through in his body. And the angel says, like, do you have any need? All right. After he relieved him of this pain and the man started to complain, he goes, you know, this pain was so awful. It's the worst I've ever felt in my life. And so the angel, he tells this man, he says that if you think about it, subhanAllah, just Allah relieving you of that pain is more substantial than the 50 plus years of worship that you engaged in. Meaning that like one of the blessings of Allah is worth more than your 50 years of actions. So we can never be too proud of the actions that we commit. You know what I'm saying? Um, that, you know, one blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so much better than any action that we engage in, right? So we always think to ourselves that, you know, the, 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 the good that Allah has given us, even the trials that Allah has given us are means of, 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 of His mercy, right? Means of his, uh, his, his favor upon us. 
even if they are bad or we deem them as bad, right? Because if it wasn't for things that we would deem as bad, we would not have opportunities to observe things like patience, right? Imagine if nothing ever bad happened to you or nothing you know, difficult ever you know, uh, had befallen you. You would never have even an opportunity to prove your sabr, to prove your patience because every moment is easy, right? So even through moments of trials and difficulties, Allah gives you chances to kind of gain reward. And we all know those narrations about how any moment of uh, difficulty or trial is a means of Allah cleansing your sins, right? And there's a hadith that literally says that a person will be walking upon this earth and they will be tried so much to the extent that Allah will have wiped them clean of all of their sins and mistakes by the time that they pass away. That's the point of trials and tribulations, y'all. Uh, the, one of the biggest benefits of trials and tribulations is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quite literally uh, causing you to shed your sins every single time that you're tested. Um, and so that's something for us to always keep in mind. And he said even like the, the prick of a thorn does not uh, you know, uh, befall a believer except that which it removes sins from his, his body, right? So we're very cognizant of this. We're very aware of this reality that we're not just going through difficult times because it's just random or it's just a coincidence. There's purpose and uh, reason behind everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, even if it transcends our own reasoning, right? This is a part of being a Muslim. Okay, let's inshallah move on to our chapter for today. The chapter that we are going to engage in today is called Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And there's going to be a lot of beauty to today's session because we're going to be kind of divulging into the depths and the layers of our religion. It's no longer surface level. There are things that we can like unfold that will help us access different layers of our deen. It's almost like when you play a video game, right? Like you don't even know what you're missing out on when you can't get past a certain level, right? Like you think that like the end of this entire game is just like at the end of level two. And then you find out that there's level 30 and you're like, oh my God, like what's in level third? I, I don't even know what level three looks like. What does level 30 look like? And so Islam is the same way, where Islam is not just a surface level deen. Islam is a deen that requires us to unfold the next level, the next layer. How can we get deeper and deeper into our religion? And, you know, for a person who has any irada, any desire, any yearning to seek a further relationship with Allah, they will want to seek those next layers. They're not, you know, like, and this is like the, you know, you know, there's greed that's bad and there's actually greed that's good. Greed that is bad is greed that's anything related to dunya. But greed when it comes to deen can actually be beneficial for a person. That when a person learns how to, you know, say the Arabic alphabet, the next thing that they want is to connect the letters together. And when they connect the letters together, they want to be able to read the next line. When they read the next line, they want to be able to gain fluency. When they gain fluency, they want to start memorizing. And when they start memorizing, they want to preserve their memorization. And then when they preserve their memorization, they want to learn about the meaning of it. I mean, there's always something to unlock, right? And I'm sure everyone in here has actually witnessed that reality, which is that you want to continue to do more and do better. So when as a Muslim, we kind of get stagnant and we stay at the same level, we unfortunately are actually robbing ourselves of an experience that we could be having, right? And so our goals as, as Muslims are to try and unlock that next layer of our religion, right? We, we have been going through this text for now the past like two and a half months at this point. We had Sheikh Omar come in and share his reflections with us. And we're just unlocking new levels. We're unlocking new chapters. And so we're broadening our depth to this, this, this beautiful deen that Allah has given us the privilege of being a part of, right? That once you taste salah, you want to connect to something more than just your obligatories, right? You pray Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. Now you want to engage in your sunnah. Once you engage in your sunnah, now you want to try your, your, your hand at waking up in the middle of the night and praying to hajjud. What does that feel like, right? I know what it feels like to pray in the morning before the sun rises, but I wonder what it feels like to wake up at 2 a.m. and offer like two raka'ah or four raka'ah of nafil prayer. What does that feel like, right? So we always are curious. We're almost greedy in that way. And that type of greed is not bad. In fact, it's something that allows you to get closer to Allah. So he begins this chapter... And he says, in this dunya, the straight path, the Sirat al-Mustaqim, comprises of three levels. 
three different levels. He says, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Okay? If I were to ask somebody to translate the word Islam, how would you translate it? Submission. Okay, good. The idea of submitting to God, right? Anybody else? How would you translate Islam? So submission, we got that one down. What else? Any peace, okay, peace through submission possibly. Okay, good. What do you think of when you think about, okay, especially when you look at these three words, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. What, what, what is it about Islam that makes it Islam and the other two that make it the other two? Islam is referring to your obligatories, right? Like what makes you a Muslim? Like what do you have to do in order to be Muslim? And obviously we know the, 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 the pillars that come along with this, this word, right? And so he says, whoever remains on the level of Islam until they pass away will be saved from an eternity in the fire and he must enter paradise, even if before this he is punished in the fire for a period of time. Now this is really interesting, right? It kind of opens up this, this interesting conversation about you know, will Muslims enter hellfire ever, right? And if you're in hellfire, do you stay there forever? Or can you leave after a period of time, right? And there are differences of opinions about this, by the way. There are certain people who say that if you are going to hellfire, you will be in there, fiha khalidina fiha, right? Allah mentions that in the Quran several times. Khalidina fiha abada, that they will be in there forever. But, we also know that there are narrations of the Prophet ﷺ where he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually free people from hellfire. Like they may be in there for a small period of time, but because of the immense mercy of Allah, Allah will free you from there. And so he says here that a person who has Islam, okay, they have Islam, they will be saved from an eternity in the hellfire and they must enter paradise, even if before they were they tasted punishment to a certain degree. Now, this is interesting, right? Because there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he says that there will come a time, okay? عَلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ زَمَانٌ تُخْفِقُ أَبْوَابُهَا لَيْسَ فِيهَا أَحَدٌ وَذَلِكَ بَعْدَ مَا يَلْبَثُونَ فِيهَا أَحْقَابٌ He says that there will come a time when the doors of hellfire are blown open. They are basically completely wide open and there will be no one left in it. And this will be after a period of time. So subhanAllah, I want you guys to think about this. That there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he does mention that there will come a time where a hellfire's doors will be blown open. And there will be no one left in it. Like it will be vacant. It will be empty. And so certain scholars, they say that the tremendous mercy of Allah is that eventually, eventually someone will inshallah leave hellfire if they're even, even if they're punished, right? And so he talks about the first level, which is Islam. Now, this entire thing comes from a really cool story of the Prophet Sallallahu life, okay? And I want everyone to really kind of like key in on this because it's beautiful. The story, it, it happened in the very latter time, latter kind of years of the Prophet's life. Some of the scholars, they even say that it was about 70 to 80 days before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. I want you guys to think about that. So it happened very late. And the story happens just like a lot of other stories happen in the life of the Prophet where he was sitting surrounding a lot of his companions and they were sitting just like this. I want you guys to think about this. Like, you know, when we look at the hadith of the Prophet sometimes we think about very like profound settings, right? We're like, oh, Badr, Uhud, right? When you think about like Hijra, oh, moving from Mecca to Medina, it had like these grand settings. But there were a lot of narrations in the life of the Prophet that started just like this. Like he was sitting. And there were a lot of other people around him that were sitting, talking to him, engaging with him. And something really fascinating happened, right? And so in one of these situations, this was the setting in which this particular story takes place in. And literally, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he actually literally says it. He says, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ He says that we were sitting with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on this random day. We were sitting with the Prophet on this random day. And he says, He says that all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this man appeared out of nowhere. He appeared out of nowhere. It's not like they saw him 
like arriving, coming from a far distance. He literally, it says that he appeared. Like he appeared upon us out of nowhere. So I want you guys to think about like soul food right now. Y'all are sitting here. Imagine, you know that scene from Harry Potter where like Hermione just shows up in classes and she uses like weird time turner thing and she just, no one ever saw her coming into the room, right? But she just randomly appears when they look over. I want you guys to think about that. Like what's the difference? The difference is when you see someone walking to you from a far distance, you can almost think about like an origin where they came from. Oh, they parked their car right in that parking spot. They walked up the sidewalk. They walked through that door. They put their shoes over there. Then they came and had a seat next to me. I can see where they came from. But when a person says, a man appeared out of nowhere, it's like I look back, he wasn't there, I turned forward, and then I look back again, he was sitting next to me. Like, where did he come from? There's like there's a mystery around it, right? And he says, Okay. Umar radiallahu an, he says that his dress was extremely white, abyad. Like it was very white, like he looked like amazing. Like his clothing was awesome, right? Like when you looked at the way that he dressed, it was like, wow, this man just like went to the dry cleaner before he came to halaqa tonight. You know, like that man like definitely just washed that entire like garment before he showed up to Jummah that day, right? So he says that he was dressed in, 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 in complete white. But then he says, Shadidu sawa the shi'r. And he says his hair was like completely dark, black. So he was not old. He was like a very, very striking man, okay? And he says, لا يرى عليه أثر السفر That none of us saw any like traces of travel on him. Meaning that like, it didn't make sense. Like we didn't, like I, I don't think he came from anywhere far. But then he says, وَلَا يَعْرِفُهُ minna أَحَدٌ But the weird part about all this is that none of us recognized who he was. See, it was like a catch-22. If somebody recognizes a person, that means that they're a local. But if we didn't recognize him, that means he's from out of town. But we also said that he had no traces of travel on him. So how is that possible? Something's not adding up to this story. And Umar, he says that, and he sat right in front of the Prophet ﷺ, right in front of him. Like he came into the middle of this majlis and he came and sat in front of the Prophet. I want you guys to imagine that like someone at Soul Food or Heart Work or Imam uh, Sheikh Mikhail's Wednesday Halaqa, like usually the people that show up a little bit later, what do they do? Where do they sit? They're like in the back, right? They're trying to sneak in really quickly. Maybe they grab a drink from Sahba. They go sit on that back green couch over there trying to like make no noise to capture any attention. Now there's like a whole different level of confidence when homeboy walks through the front door, sits right here and just stares. You're like, what is, what's going on? I don't even know who this guy is, right? But this confidence is like exuding from him. And so he says, Hatta jalasa ila Nabi sallallahu He sat in front of the Prophet sallallahu and he put his knees to the knees of the Prophet So I want you guys to imagine how close he was, right? Like, I know I gave you guys the example of a person coming and sitting right there, but imagine a person coming, like I'm sitting here right now. Imagine if he came and he sat right here. And like all of you guys are like, Umar bin Khattab. <laughs> and you're like writing this down, you're like, Oh my God, where's he gonna, what's he going to do next? Like, it's a miracle that no one tackled him. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a miracle no one took him down. Because if someone got that close to the Prophet ﷺ, usually it's like, uh, like, is that his, like, long-lost cousin that, like, we haven't heard about? Like, who is this guy? So everyone was just, like, shocked, right? And this man, he puts his hand, وَوَضَعَ كَفَيْهِ عَلَى فَخِدَيْهِ and he puts his hand on the like the 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 knee of the prophet, like the 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 thigh of the prophet. Like he kind of like rests his hand on the prophet. And this is like really like close, like really close quarters, right? And he starts talking to the prophet. He says, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni an al-Islam. And what's what, what's another like weird kind of 
code giveaway that he's not a normal person. He calls him what? He calls him Muhammad. No one would dare call him that, right? Anyone who's a companion of the Prophet ﷺ would never ever address the Prophet ﷺ by his name. They would always call him Nabiullah, Rasulullah. This man, he comes in and says, Ya Muhammad. He's like addressing him as his equal. And he says, Akhbirni an al-Islam. Tell me about Islam. And so the Prophet ﷺ takes him to school. <laughs> he takes him to Sunday school, level one. And he goes, Al-Islam, okay, he says, Al-Islamu an tashhada an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He says, Islam is simple, man. It's not difficult. Islam is just you telling yourself and believing and testifying that there is no God except God and that I'm the messenger of God. And then he says, wa tuqima salah wa tu'tiya zakah he says that it's the five pillars. Simple. How many of y'all raise your hand if you know the five pillars? It's not a trick question. Okay, alhamdulillah. Right, you guys passed the test. I mean, like, if you know the five pillars, it's like you passed like level one of Sunday school, alhamdulillah. Right, like you get it. You get the pillars that this religion is built upon. And so then, you know what the funniest part of the story is? <laughs> It says here that this man, he says, Sadaqta. He goes, yeah, you're right. And so Umar ibn Khattab, he goes, فَعَجِبْنَ لَهُ يَسْأَلُهُ وَيُصَدِّقُهُ He goes, what the? Why is the dude that's asking the question the one who's like, yeah, you're right? That means two things. That either means that he already knows Right? Like he's just here to reconfirm something that he already knows. Or number two, which is he's being a little like sarcastic, right? Like he's being a little bit of like a sarcastic guy here. So Umar's ears are like perked up. Okay? And so the Prophet ﷺ, he literally answers this question of what Islam is as if you just fulfill those obligatories. Think about it, guys. How many of y'all, just think about it in your own heart. How many of y'all have said Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah in your lifetime? You took care of that first pillar. How many of y'all have engaged in your prayer? That's your second pillar right there. How many of you guys have fasted in the month of Ramadan? There's your third pillar right there. How many of you guys have given zakah? I mean, maybe, maybe not. Some of y'all are struggling, but inshallah you'll get there, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> zakah, zakah is obviously upon people who can pay it, right? They're of the wealth that they can pay zakah. And then obviously hajj, the Prophet ﷺ, he even says in this hadith, he says that it's, a, it, it's obligatory for a person who has the means of doing it, right? So, but let's say hypothetically, everyone has the ability to do it, they would do it, right? And so in this book right here, y'all can see it, a person who just fulfills those five, Allah, even if Allah allows that person temporarily to taste the hellfire, he will enter, he must enter paradise after a period of time. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing he says, whoever remains on the level of Iman until he dies, check this out. What's Iman? You want to hear what Iman is? So this man, he asked the Prophet, he says, أَخْبِرْنِي عَنْ iman And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, أَن تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِي وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنُوا Iman is believing in God with believing in who Allah is, knowing who Allah is, believing in His Messenger, believing in His angels, believing in His books, believing in the Day of Judgment, and believing in, what did I say? What's Qadr, y'all? Anyone know what Qadr is? Yeah, like divine decree. That whatever happens to you, it's something that is within the folds of Allah's wisdom. So there's nothing that happens to you that Allah does not know about. How many of you guys, be honest, let's get like a little bit of feedback here. How many of you guys receive some sort of comfort from that statement? That whatever happens to you, Allah has known about it. It gives me a lot of comfort in my heart. Like nothing's random. You know, like the idea of coincidence sometimes gives people anxiety. Like, oh, what, like, what, I, I, like, no, like this wasn't supposed to happen. Like, why'd this happen? Like, why, what, like I, I planned for something totally different. Once a person is able to believe and confirm in their heart that whatever is happening to me is something that Allah has allowed to happen to me. Oh, there's comfort in that. How many of you guys, you guys saw that video 
of that man this week in Palestine. The grandfather who had that granddaughter named Reem. Y'all heard that story this week? Super famous, mashallah, now. I mean, he was holding his granddaughter Reem, and he kept on saying to her, like, Allah, Allah is protecting you. Allah has you. Allah has you. And he even took like an earring that she was wearing, and he was talking to her as though she was still alive. He was literally looking at his granddaughter in the eyes, even though she was no longer there. And he was speaking to her as though she was still in front of him. And she goes, can I take this? Asking her permission. Can I take this? And he takes her earring and he puts it on his like, he puts it on like his, his pocket right here. And he goes, I wear this like a badge of honor. I wear it like a badge of honor because I'm her grandfather. Like, I'm hers. She's mine. He kept on saying, ruh al ruh, right? Like, she's the soul of my soul. Like, me and her together. You know why, by the way, subhanAllah, I kind of like looked into it further. I was watching a few more videos about why he said that specifically. And there were comments in Arabic that were basically saying that he said that ruh al ruh because she was his daughter's daughter. She was his daughter's daughter. So his daughter is his soul. And so she's the soul of his daughter. So that's why she's, that, that's why his soul is her soul and she's from him. Like what an amazing man. I mean like, subhanAllah. Y'all see the other video that came out a few days ago about him talking to the other girl who lost her leg or her arm. He was speaking to another person. This man's like become like, this man's like become like an incredible like imam in Gaza right now. He's basically spe he's speaking to this girl who had her limb amputated because of like the, like one of the airstrikes going off and she basically got her limb like harmed to the point where the doctors had to remove it. And she was obviously, she's like this young kid, she's like seven, eight years old, and she's asking all these questions about like, why, why, right? I'll never have like this arm ever again in my life, or I'll never have this leg again in my life. And he was sitting there, you know what he said to her? SubhanAllah, think about this statement. He goes, your arm beat you to paradise. <laughs> he said that straight to her. He goes, it beat you to Jannah. Like it's gonna be, it's gonna ask where you are once you get there. Like Allah has given it like a head start. So you'll have it back when you get to Jannah and you'll be rejoined with it when you get to Jannah. And there was like this like this like small, very subtle smile that broke out on her face. And like, man, this Iman, where the Prophet he says, وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ That belief, Iman, is believing in Allah's plan it doesn't matter whether you think right away it's good or bad. You just know that it's Allah's plan. Because how many times have you ever said in your life that, oh, this thing is good, and you ended up finding out years later that it was really bad. We're such bad assessors of things in life. Do you guys agree with that as human beings? Like we're very poor assessors. We always think that certain things are true when they're not true, or certain things are this way and they're not that way. We're like, oh my God, like, this is the best job I'll ever have in my life. And two years later, you're like, oh, I can't wait to go home, right? Two years ago, you're like, oh my God, this friend is like the best human being I've ever met in my life. And two years later, you're like, yeah, we don't talk anymore. You know, like, we're such bad assessors of things. So one of my teachers, he told me, he's like, you ever want to believe in the qadr of Allah? Just think about how many times you've been wrong. <laughs> You'll start believing in Allah's qadr real quick. If you just go back in your life and think about how many times you miscalled something or you missed like a call, you missed like, a, like, a, like an observation in your life, you'll be reminded about why Allah is Allah and you are who you are, right? And so he says, for the people of Iman, whoever remains on this level until they die will be prevented from entering hellfire altogether because the light of Iman extinguishes the blaze of Jahannam to the point where Jahannam itself, it says, O oh believer, Ya Mu'minu, O oh believer, go on your way, get out of here. <laughs> your light has extinguished my fire, you're ruining it. <laughs> so the hellfire will literally say to a person who's a Mu'min, like, there's no spot for you here. In fact, you even coming close to me is like taking away what I am. It teaches you a couple of things. It teaches you, number one, that hellfire is 
not like a place only. It's a living, breathing thing. Y'all understand that? A lot of times when we talk about like Jannah and Jahannam, we think about places, right? Like you learn in like English grammar that there are nouns. Nouns are what? Time, place, or whatever, right? Like that's what nouns are. And we all, whenever we think of Jahannam, we think of place. We think of place. We think of, oh, this is a place where something happens. No, no, no. Jahannam is something that moves. Jahannam is something that sees, that speaks, that hears. And so Jahannam will tell a person who has iman in their heart, get away from me. Go on. He goes, your light is too strong for me. And this is why he quotes here that Imam Ahmed, he's put in his musnad that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, that there is no righteous person or sinner except that they may taste hellfire for a little bit. It, but it will be a source of coolness and peace for the believer just as it was for Ibrahim to the point where the fire itself will raise and cry at its coolness. This is the legacy of the people who are muhabba. They are Habib of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Like imagine subhanAllah a person who is so enlightening that their light illuminates the room that they walk in, spiritually. They walk into a room and subhanAllah, people can't help but like feed off of their energy. There are people like that, by the way, in this dunya. I know you know these people. There are people probably in your lives that embody this, this teaching. That when you see them, they almost like have this nur. You know when they say like, oh, you have this nur on your face. You have this light on your face. What does that mean? It's not a light that like physically is like shining on their face, but it's a light of iman. You can tell it's on them. You can tell it's on them. There are proofs of this, by the way, in hadith, where the Prophet ﷺ, he says one time that I'll be able to recognize the people of my ummah on the day of judgment by the traces of wudu on their body. You can't see the traces of wudu on your body right now. But you'll be able to see it on the Day of Judgment. Like, like whoever has made wudu today, inshallah, you did. Hopefully we're not people who like have wudu for like four days straight. It's kind of questionable wudu, right? And brother, you have wudu. Hey, yeah, man, I did it like a week ago. Like, Habibi, what? SubhanAllah, right? Wow, I got to be around this guy. Super pure, Mr. Tahara over here. So like, you know, but like the, the wudu that a person makes, yeah, you might not be able to see it here, but you'll be able to see it on the hereafter. Imagine like how many people on the Day of Judgment. I always think about this, like this imagery in my head. I think about sometimes like, on the day of judgment, imagine the people who are close to Allah, like you can see them like as being like beacons of light in like that plane of judgment, right? Like you have like these like awliya on the day of judgment. Like a lot of us are gonna be like super just like regular normal people. And then you'll have a few people every 10 or 15 people, they're just gonna be lighting up their row. Like their light is so bright, it'll be lighting up their entire row. And this is what uh, Ibn Rajab, he's talking about here. And he continues and he says, now, whoever is on this level of ihsan, now we talked about Islam, and we talked about Iman, and now we're going to be talking about ihsan. Now let's talk about what ihsan is. How many, how many of you guys know what ihsan is? Anybody? Confident enough to know what ihsan is? Raise your hand. Ihsan, something. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a step further than Iman. Okay, good. Anybody? Take a shot at it? Yes? Okay, good. Getting close. Excellence, right? Ihsan, as the Prophet described it, he says, Al-Ihsan, an ta'budu allaha ka'annaka tarahu fa'in lam takun tarahu fa'innahu yarak. He says, Ihsan, defined, is worshipping God as though you can see him. That's what Ihsan is. It's like a person who prays, right? I want you guys to think about the levels of th these three levels, right? A person who's just, they embody Islam, they, they'll pray, but they're praying because, yeah, it's obligatory, I gotta do this thing, right? And then you have people of Iman. They pray because when they step up onto that prayer rug, all they can think about is who Allah is. And they think about the Prophet. Y'all ever thought about like what you're supposed to think about when you pray? Anybody in here? Like, am I supposed to like imagine like this picture? <laughs> what am I supposed to do, right? Like, especially when the carpet in front of you is like super, super like aesthetically pleasing. You're like, oh my God, like Mecca. Wow, look at that, right? 
unless you're at Qalam and you see blue and gray and you're like, oh, wow, cool colors, right? Like, we're inshallah going to be changing that, don't worry. Um, like you, you, uh, you, you know, like what are you supposed to be thinking about? So the people of Iman, they might be thinking about Allah. They might be thinking about who Allah is. They might be thinking about who the Prophet is. They may be thinking about the Quran that they're reading, right? They may be thinking about the Day of Judgment. They may be thinking about what happened to them this past year. Those are people of Iman. And subhanAllah, a moment of kind of, I'm not trying to gas y'all up, but a moment of like, you know, a little building a little self-confidence. How many of y'all have done that in your prayer? You sat there in your salah and you thought about like your life, what you went through this past year, what you went through just yesterday, what you endured this past month. That's iman. That's thinking about qadr. Have y'all ever stepped up in the prayer and thought about jannah? Yeah, that's iman right there. Belief in the day of judgment, belief in the hereafter. Those are people of iman. But now, there's another level. And the Prophet says that the highest level is a person who when they pray, they're acting as though God is in front of them. Because you know, even when we're thinking about, you know, Jannah, and we're thinking about our past month, we're thinking about, you know, we're thinking about certain things. Sometimes like we lose ourselves in our prayer. We forget where we are. We, we kind of like rush through it a little bit. But imagine a person who prays as though Allah is in front of them. Now, what does that person's prayer look like? That person's prayer is like, it's like they're on a security camera. They're thinking about every step they take. Allahu Akbar. They're not rushing Subhana Rabbil Ala. How many of us, when we're saying Subhana Rabbil Ala, we're like, Ya Subhana Rabbil Ala, Subhana Rabbil Ala, Subhana Rabbil and we just get back up. This person, they're praying as though Allah is in front of them. And what does the Prophet say? فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ And even though they can't see him, فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ They know that Allah can see them. They function in life with the knowledge that Allah is watching every single thing that I do. And so this is why he quotes right here in this particular ayah in the Quran. He says, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةٌ for those who do good is the best reward and an addition was ziyada. And I'll tell you guys what ziyada means. Check this out. This is, gonna, this is gonna be deep, deep today, inshallah. Actually, you know what? Anybody wanna read this? This is super deep. I want someone to read this. Who wants to read Bismillah? Anybody? You wanna go ahead? Go ahead. The authentic hadith mentions. Subhanallah. So, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً The ziyada is looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. This is the greatest reward anybody can ever hope for in our existence. So literally Allah will ask these people in paradise, يَا أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ Because are you happy? And think about it, right? Like you're, you're like living in like your eighth palace of the day. <laughs> you're just you know, pa palace hopping, right? And you're eating your like eighth, like, you know, favorite food of all time for the day. You're drinking like your 10th bottle of like whatever. And you're just kind of like chilling, hanging out. You're enjoying like the cool breeze, right? And all of a sudden Allah asks you, hey, are you happy? Are you good? And a person will respond, Allah, what do you, what do you mean am I good? You see me? Like I, I'm... I am the happiest I've ever been. I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. You've made our faces radiant. You have, you know, you, you have saved us from a terrible punishment. How can, you, how can we not be happy? And then Allah will say, let me give you something even better and he will remove a veil and they will be able to look at him. 
and by Allah, he will not have granted them anything more beloved to them than this. And at this point, Ibn Rajab, he continues, and he says, he talks a little bit more in detail about this. He talks about the people on in the hereafter who will be looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the time that they will be spending with him, right? And so he says right here, all the inhabitants of paradise will have a share of this vision, but they will differ as to their closeness when seeing him and in the number of times they see him. So the people of Jannah will be able to see Allah, but it will differ in terms of their rank in paradise. So the higher up you are in paradise, the more frequently you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of the people of paradise will see him on the day of, of, of Jum'ah. So Friday, subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want you to think about that, right? The day of Jum'ah in Jannah will also be significant. It's not just like Jum'ah is a thing in this dunya. Jum'ah in the Akhirah will also be a day of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The difference is, in this dunya, your, your relationship with Allah is just based off of your belief. Your relationship with Allah in the hereafter on Jum'ah will be one where you will see Him. Okay? And I want you guys to see one thing that's powerful, powerful here. Check this out. There's a scholar who said that the ulama have all agreed upon that... Allah cannot be seen in this world. Like Allah, one of the, the, the challenges of faith is that you cannot physically see God in this world. Okay? Not with the eyes, nor can they see Allah with the heart, except through the perspective of yaqeen, of certainty, right? Like you know Allah is there. That's, that's your extent of your relationship with Allah in this dunya. He says, this is because seeing Sight is from the greatest of blessings and such is befitting that it only occurs in the best of places. I want you to say, how many of you guys can see? Like 2020 vision. Anybody? 2020 vision? SubhanAllah, Allah has challenged the Ummah. Ya Allah. Okay. I, obviously, I, I, don't, I don't need to speak much, right? So, <laughs> like, I want anyone to think about it when you get up and you're able to see. You don't realize this, but those of you who are like four eyes, like me, some of you guys like six eyes, bifocals, I don't know. Like you, you know that you would do anything to be able to wake up in the morning and see without putting a pair of glasses on. You know what that yearning feels like, right? Could you imagine like my wife, sometimes she like, when she wakes up in the morning with me, she's like, you know, you have those like intrusive thoughts in the morning, right? You wake up and she like looks at me one time and I put on my glasses. She's like, how does it feel? And I'm like, how did you feel? Right? Like, and she's like, how, I was like, what do you mean? How's it? She goes, so like, what can you see when you wake up? And we have like a fan above our bed, right? So I'm like, I can see like a circular thing. And I can see that it has like six like things sticking out of it. And she goes, you can't see like down like the room. You can't see like that, the, the, the thing over there. And she's like, I'm like, Habibi, like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm not like you, okay? Like, I can't see. It's like, it's like a huge blessing, man. Like, you don't realize how blessing, how much blessing like eyesight is. You don't realize it, right? So the scholar, he says, that sight is one of the greatest blessings that you can have in this dunya. One of the greatest blessings you can have in this dunya. And so the seeing of Allah physically is supposed to be reserved for the best place that you can imagine, which is Jannah. That's why you can't see Allah Ta'ala with your own eyes in this life. Okay? And so he says that for people of Ihsan, the generality of the people of paradise have their provision given to them twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. Whereas the people of Ihsan see him in the morning and the evening, neither palaces can make those who are pious forget their beloved, nor can running rivers quench their thirst. One of them used to say, when I am hungry, remembrance of Allah is my food. And why not, when I am thirsty, witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my gratification. And this next one is powerful. He says, one of the righteous was seen in a dream and he was asked about the condition of two scholars to which he replied, at this time I have left them before Allah, eating and drinking and enjoying bliss. And he was asked, what about you? And he says, he knows my lack of desire for food, so instead he allows me to look at him. So looking at Allah is better than all of the rewards of paradise. And I wanted to end today's session with a little bit of an exercise. I want you to think of how every moment in life, every blessing in life 
is only there because Allah allowed it to be there. I want you guys to think about that. So when you think about the things that you have in your life, ask where that originated from. Remember the story I told you guys about that man who worshipped for 50 years and he was very proud of his actions. And so when Allah gave him that pain in his body, he was unable to pray, he was unable to sleep. He would not have been able to worship for 50 years if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give him the health to worship him. I want you to think of anything in your life that you consider a blessing. Think about your parents. Think about your health. Think about your time. Think about your ability to rest. Think about your sanity and mind. Think about anything that you have in your life that you consider a blessing. And I want you to go back and trace the origin of that blessing. Where did your time come from? Where did your family come from? Where did your health come from? And this is why he continues and he says, the people with the lowest rank in paradise will look at their dominion for 2,000 years, seeing the furthest end of it as he sees the nearest end of it. And he will look at his spouses and his servants. Meaning that the lowest rank in paradise is like a dream in this dunya. Like a person who has the lowest hierarchy in Jannah will seem like the king of kings in paradise. But the person who has the highest ranking in paradise will look at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala twice a day. And he said, this is why the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to recite, وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرًا إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَ نَاظِرًا The day faces will be pleased, looking at their Lord well pleased. I want you guys to think about that. And although you don't have that in this life, although you don't have that in this life, I want you to think about moments in this life where you can be pleased being in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although you can't see Allah physically with your own eyes, think about the moments you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within your heart. And don't rob yourselves of those moments. Don't rob yourselves of those moments in which it's just you and God alone. Because there will be time in your dunya where you will be with other people. You will be with your friends. You will be at your job. You will be there enjoying this moment of entertainment, whatever it may be. But those moments that you have with Allah are extremely special. Those moments that you have with Allah when you're by yourself are extremely special. Do not waste those moments you have with Him. It's like a friend that you have an experience with in your life when you are completely private with them. And you're having these moments in which you're engaging with them, you're having conversations with them, that if you told somebody else, they wouldn't get it. Y'all ever had those moments in your life where you had an experience with somebody and you tried to tell somebody else what it was like? You're like, oh yeah, like we spoke about this and we went there and we ate this food and that. And the person's like, yeah, yeah okay. And you're like, ah. you don't get it. You don't get it. It's okay. You don't get it though. I want those moments that you have with Allah to feel like that. Those moments where your head is touching the sajda and you're saying subhana rabbi ala and you have that intimate moment with God. That's a moment that should almost be indescribable through words. And you know why sometimes we don't feel anything when we say those words? It's because we're not really there we're rushing through it we're going through it like it's just like a it's like a chore subhan rabbil ala subhan rabbil ala subhan rabbil ala but imagine have y'all ever seen those people who get lost in their sajda <laughs> they're down there and you're like oh my god are they ever gonna get up i want you to think about why they're, they're they're in sajda for so long I want you to think about why they are in sajda for so long. You know, I was saying, I'm, I'm going to share you guys an, I'm going to share an intrusive thought with you guys. Yesterday when I was praying, I remember this was Isha last night. I was actually at my masjid in South Lake, and I was praying Isha last night. And I went down in, in, into my rukur position. And you know, sometimes like when you do something so frequently, you forget like the actual meaning of what you do. Like it just... It's just like a motion to you, right? You're just like up and down, up and down, up and down, sit, get back up, down, sit, get back up, down, sit, salam, salam, that's it. When I was in Ruku yesterday at Isha, a thought dawned upon me that I haven't thought about in a long time. 
I'm bowing down to something. I'm bowing down to someone. Al-Ihsan, an ta'budullaha ka'annaka tarahu. I'm bowing down to Allah in front of me. Have y'all ever bowed down to anybody? Like, you probably haven't. We live in a 2023. Like, you just don't do that anymore. When you bow down to somebody, you're bowing down. And our etiquette, our adab, and, and our prayer is that you don't look up because whoever you're bowing down to is too great to look at at that moment. So all you're doing is looking down here, but you know there's someone in front of you that's worthy of you bowing down to him. And I remember, like, one of the congregations, like, you know, one of the congregants that came up to me after, they're like, they're like, Imam Safi, you, you were in Rukur for like really long in that second rakah. I was like, my bad, dude. <laughs> I was like, I got a little lost. For a moment, I forgot that when you're in your Rukur, you're bowing down to your king. That is the king of kings. You're bowing down to Allah. And I just wanted to be in that position. Like I just imagine like Allah on his throne and you're bowing down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a moment that I felt very personally. And I didn't want to end that moment. And so we never want to rob ourselves of those experiences. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of the people who never rush our moments of being with him. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be people who never ever take for granted the opportunities that he has given us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never take away this deen from us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be people who appreciate and benefit from this deen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow our deen to be that which takes us into the highest levels of paradise in which, inshallah, we will be in his company, Azza wa Jal. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve the people of Palestine from the occupation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to end the oppression that the people of Palestine are going through. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to end the genocide in Palestine and in all other parts of the world, including Sudan, including the Congo, including Burma, including the Uyghur community in China. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve every Muslim who is going through oppression. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift that oppression off of them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant the highest levels of paradise for the people who have passed away in, Pal in Palestine. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow them to be reunited with their loved ones in the highest levels of paradise. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to replace their homes with palaces in paradise. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be in their company in Jannah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from their iman in this dunya. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for all of our shortcomings that we are so, so susceptible to in this life. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept any good that we have done any type of khair that we have engaged in, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept those moments from us. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum wa khairan, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Alhamdulillah. Uh, inshallah, we will uh, continue on uh, next Thursday. Uh, we'll see you all then, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakum wa khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Inshallah, if anybody has any questions, you can inshallah come up to me uh, afterwards and we'll inshallah chit chat a little bit. And Isha is at 8.15, by the way, in the Qalam prayer hall. So uh, for those of us who are here uh, and want to pray Isha, they'll be at 8.15.